Wow, full house. Thank you for your interest. And uh, thanks Steve for presenting me. Uh, it's a hot topic, obviously. And uh, as a normal speaker who is going to talk about ChatGPT, guess what I did? I asked ChatGPT. Give me a nice introduction to the audience. And uh, yeah, it, it wanted some details. And after that, I got uh, the introduction. So very, very quickly about me. I'm from Sofia, Bulgaria. I am uh, I'm with QA since 2005, uh, climbing the whole career rather from junior QA, even what is QA, to uh, consulting uh, different uh, big brands. And uh, currently I am head of engineering uh, in Puyant.io and also have my own companies that organizes events. Uh, one of them is QA Challenge Accepted uh, in Sofia, Bulgaria. And uh, listen carefully because uh, at the end I'm giving free tickets for my conference. Cool. Now, uh, first, uh, I applied uh, for this talk like, uh, let's say, almost a year ago. And it was something new, something fresh, something cool. Now, everywhere I go, they are talking about AI. And I'm really surprised that there are so many people in this room now, because, come on, uh, aren't you getting bored of all the AI hype? Uh, just compare this to other big services and see how rapidly ChatGPT became so popular. Actually, instead of agenda, I'm going to present you the hype cycle of Gartner, which is applicable for almost every technology. So, uh, what we are going to talk on uh, this talk. First, I'll explain very quickly how we got there. Then, uh, we go down the swap to how large language models actually work. And, of course, we reach the plateau of productivity and I'll explain how to be productive as a QA using artificial intelligence. Let's kick it. So, how we got there? By the way, these are uh, AI-generated uh, images, of course. And if you see the small letters, I'm using Microsoft Bing Image Creator for some of these. Okay. Very, very quickly going through the history. It starts in the 50s. Maybe most of you have heard about uh, Alan Turing. Later on, we have uh, 1956, when Dartmouth College, uh, for first time, make uh, AI an academic discipline. Then we make very fast forward to the 2010s. Of course, every decade we have uh, some new things uh, appearing. We have expert systems, we have neural networks, machine learning, NLP, deep learning, big data, cloud computing. but uh, Maybe the most important reason we are all here today is transformers. Transformers, these are more special type of uh, neural networks that are used for sequence to sequence tasks in uh, NLP. And uh, the most important characteristic is their self-attention mechanism that uh, is uh, very largely used in the generative AI models. So, what happened actually? Uh, in 2018, GPT-1 was uh, released and uh, yeah, G GPT stands short for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. Uh, in the same year, Google released BERT with uh, 340 million parameters, but uh, none of these was uh, good enough. So, they released on the next year GPT-2 with uh, 1.5 billion parameters and it started generating not bad texts. So people decided, okay, that could be actually quite promising. And what they did on the next year, they scraped absolutely the entire internet, literally everything they could reach, blogs, forums, uh, websites, everything. and. Uh, 2020, we got GPT-3 with uh, 175 billion parameters. Then it was fine-tuned. 
I'm going to explain that in a while. And uh, this year we, we got GPT-4 released with 1.76 trillion parameters. So just imagine what happened in three years in terms of parameters, uh, sorry, five years. We got from 0 0.34 to 1,700 parameters with GPT-4. And of course, it is not only OpenAI. We also have Google Palm, NVIDIA and Microsoft also joined uh, their forces for MTNLG. We have uh, Big Science Boom, and uh, Big Science Boom is actually open source, and MetaLama 2 became open source because it leaked. Anyway, uh, the last two are actually with some additional libraries available on GitHub. Uh, you're able on relatively regular machine to be able to use large language models. And uh, these leaks actually allowed the IT community more or less to understand how this thing works without having uh, machines that cost millions of dollars. So, how these large language models actually works. As most of you probably know, computers, they don't like words. They work with numbers. And uh, actually, the first uh, Transformers did the most elementary thing uh, that everyone would uh, consider, assign number to each word in the dictionary. The new Transformers are almost the same, but they are using tokens. Why tokens? Because uh, some words have, let's say, singular and plural forms. Sometimes, uh, well, depending on the language, you can have complex uh, words consisting of two words. Uh, but just for your reference about the currency exchange rate, uh, about 100 tokens in English uh, uh, means uh, 70 uh, words. Just consider this. And if you are starting a new network, uh, 60 to 80,000 tokens is a very good uh, starting point. So let's uh, talk a little bit about training and inference. So the training, this is feeding uh, the model of a curated data set. And uh, you just provide uh, data, you know the right answers, and uh, train the network to guess what is the right answer. At the end, you tell the network, this is right or wrong. Inference is actually already trained uh, uh, network with the new data when you provide the new data and uh, the network should be exercised. To illustrate that, I'll give illustrations. So just imagine you have, uh, let's say, picture of bicycles and pictures of cars. So you train your model, you uh, uh, adapt the quotients of the neural network according to that, uh, the so-called deep learning. And after that, you provide a completely new data, which is uh, inference model, and you get uh, the, the network determines that it is uh, probably a bicycle. And uh, ChatGPT works in inference mode, which means read-only mode. So, uh, how, how actually uh, ChatGPT and the other large language models work, how, how they were trained. Okay, you, we get absolutely random sentence from the entire internet it has been trained with, and uh, we just get a random word and uh, make it blank. And we ask the neural network, what is the missing word? And uh, after, let's say, several trillions, literally trillions repetitions, uh, the neural networks start to guess quite good uh, what the next word will be. And yeah, that is a long, very expensive and very frustrating process. But at the end, we, we all get that. And uh, we have seen it already in Google. When you type, actually, it predicts what uh, the next uh, word will be. Absolutely the same way you get uh, actually an array of the probabilities for the next word when when you ask ChatGPT. And this is how the large language models actually work. And as you can see, there is an array, 
and uh, to make it uh, sound more like human, we add something that is called temperature. Temperature in the, cold, in the context of AI is a parameter that uh, tells whether we should pick the most probable element or pick something else. And uh, this is how we influence the model's probability distribution and increase the sampling variation. We don't make it more creative or something like that. It is pure science. And uh, if you are still not getting this, just check this example. So I'm giving you a sentence which is, I'm Peter Sabev from, from Bulgaria, I have a ginger cat, and TestCon Europe is a conference for QA engineers. And with uh, temperature zero, I get exactly the same sentence. With uh, 0 0.2, I get, uh, I'm okay, I'm hailing from Bulgaria, I'm owner of a ginger cat, and for your information, TestCon Europe is a QA-focused conference. And look what happens with temperature one. You are almost unable to recognize the initial text. So, hey, call me Peter Sub of Bulgaria, where I hang my hat, my ginger cat uh, rules my world, and TestCon Europe does the QA engineer heaven. Cool. So, as a result of this, some very important things we should know about the large language models. They have no internal or external memory, they have no instinct, they have no feelings. Very important, they have no goal. You have goals, they don't. Uh, there is nobody on the other side chatting with you. It is just one stateless read-only neural network that entirely uh, outputs uh, dep depending on your input. And yeah, they are really a cool tool, but uh, they are not real intelligent, intelligence. So I don't know if it is correct or not. I would vote for not uh, calling it artificial intelligence. Anyway, they have seen really the entire internet and they are really good imitational models. And that's why it looks like a real person. They are really good in imitating, and that is how you get a pathological wire. They have, uh, has some one of you asked some, uh, ask ChatGPT and uh, getting, I don't know, or I'm not sure. No, it always replies super, super confident, and it always answers. And here is another term I would like to specify, hallucination which in the field of AI it means exactly this, providing very confident answers to uh, what uh, has not been justified by the training data. And look at what I did. I wanted a positive uh, review about secrets with Titanic. And this is what I get. You see uh, Turkish bad swimming pool, some forgettable experience, and so on. So, uh, this is a typical example for hallucination. A remedy to that could be the so-called fine-tuning, and uh, ChatGPT actually spent a lot of effort into that. This is a process where you adjust the uh, neural network with some small uh, quotient changes and uh, by giving uh, minimal samples. Uh, Contrary to the training, this is much cheaper process. So if the training is five to ten num uh, to ten digits number, uh, the training could uh, the fine tuning is three to five digits, let's say. And the important part, however, is that the quality is much, 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 much more important than the quantity. So uh, this is also very useful if you are deciding to make your own neural network uh, and uh, it will actually if trains uh, training small model with uh, specific purpose mo uh, stuff will maybe uh, get even better compared to huge general purpose uh, models like uh, chat gpt so another restriction you should consider is all date for instance uh, ChatGPT has been trained up to January 2022, which means it doesn't know anything about the war in Ukraine. And uh, a quick asterisk here, ChatGPT Plus 4.0 has plugins that are currently in beta mode. So you can install plugins and get, uh, let's say, uh, some external website or uh, 
PDF document and it goes through the currently trained model. Just uh, be aware, we are not training the model with the new data, we are using the model with the existing data against the new document. But at least you can provide some more information. And here is another bottleneck you reach, and this is the limited memory. Probably some of you have already experienced that, but just imagine a very, 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 very long document about uh, cats and dogs and everything else. Uh, the sad part is that at one moment, uh, ChatGPT will remember only the bottom part of the document. It will forget about all the cats and the dogs and everything else. So, the size of that thing, I, I told you already that it's measured in tokens. We have 4,000 tokens for 3.5, 8,000 uh, tokens for uh, GPT-4, and uh, you can uh, multiply that uh, maximum by 4 if you use the API, which I highly recommend because uh, you can also regulate the, trem the temperature uh, and many other parameters. However, uh, it, it costs money. So, uh, I already told you that uh, the slight change in the input could uh, lead to huge variation in the output. And here comes another uh, very important term that is called prompt engineering. So, if you slightly change the input, you may get something completely different. And actually, ChatGPT can give you a great answer if you know what to ask. Uh, there are many expensive prompt engineering courses. I wouldn't recommend that to you. Just use your natural intelligence. Try, practice, make several prompts, adjust them, and you will reach to whatever uh, answers you want to reach. Now, uh, because uh, sometimes, as I said, uh, ChatGPT tends to forget. There is a really cool, not uh, nice uh, new feature that is called custom instructions, where you can give uh, information about uh, what would you like ChatGPT to know about you, and uh, what would you like, uh, how how would you like to respond? And uh, it is really cool. That is how actually I just said, okay, I want an introduction to the conference, and it already knew a lot of stuff. If you remember the first slide of uh, this presentation. Now, some risks and their mitigation. Let's consider that it is not a learning tool. It is a tool that actually learns itself. So. Always be critical. As I said, it sounds very confident and we should never assume that the output is 100% correct. Another important thing is that this tool has no idea what, uh, what uh, to do with uh, the information. We have no idea about uh, what is being done with it. Are there any regulations? Are, is there any specific uh, control about the model? Is there GDPR? Uh, what happens to the data we provide. So, to be on the safe side, just don't provide sensitive information. Quick asterisk, by the way, uh, ChatGPT now has an enterprise version, of course, paid, that is claimed to be SOC2 compliant, and uh, also claims that uh, it is not using the data for training, which means what? All the other data is obviously used for training. So, do not provide any sensitive information. Another thing is, if you have the great idea of, let's say, creating a startup that relies purely on some of ChatGPT functionalities, you invest millions of dollars in that startup, you build the service, it starts, works for three days, and on the fourth day, guess what? You get, uh, this prompt doesn't correspond to our guidelines and standards, for instance. What can you do? Nothing. So. Be very careful if you are planning to do any continuous operations and be aware that at any time uh, this process may stop. And now we go to the important part. I guess uh, the majority of you are QA engineers somehow. So how can we use ChatGPT? Okay, imagine that you have a huge number of such guys. They are young, they are unexperienced, a little bit dumb, a little bit autistic maybe, but they are very motivated and very confident. So, 
Two questions you have to answer. Which of your duties can you delegate so they will be able to effectively do their job? And of course, is there an effective way to check the result of their work against the potential risks? Now, maybe now is the time to make a quick comparison between the free version uh, that you can use uh, right now and the paid version that you can use after $20 per month. So, uh, for the paid version, you can choose uh, between GPT 3.5 and uh, GPT 4. Uh, also, it has uh, 10 times the parameters and 2 up to 8 times the tokens. Uh, and uh, the really cool perks are that you have access to all the new features such as image recognition, voice generation, image generation, advanced analytics. Uh, it also has plugins, as I, as I already said. And if there is a particular vote at some time, of course, people who pay are served with priority. Uh, knowing that, I, I would just like to give you some example from our QA profession. So, uh, the first thing, we have login form, I want uh, test data generated, I ask ChatGPT, okay, generate me some data, and I get uh, valid scenarios and invalid one. Uh, th this was actually quite a long response. So, uh, it was uh, not obvious, and I said, okay, put all the test cases into a table, and it did it. Note that it just uh, put also TBD, which is uh, to be determined for the outputs that, uh, uh, that are not uh, clear, so I can go to my product owner and task. Actually, at Pliant, a uh, particular use case, we had a test plan that had uh, 1,300 uh, test cases plus, and uh, of course uh, we had to remove the sensitive information. Then we went uh, uh, area by area through all of this, and uh, we finished with uh, a little bit more than 400 test cases, much better structurized and without uh, uh, missing any other functionality. So. Let's get back to the uh, form. I asked, uh, I asked, okay, I want to test the Selenium test for that. Of course, it's generated. What I need is just to uh, put the IDs of the uh, username, passport, and uh, submit button. Next, I say, okay, I, I want something different, uh, some unusual test, and uh, just have a look. I have uh, really unusual test, like uh, zero length Unicode, uh, concurrent login, high speed input, mouseless navigation. How many of your colleagues would probably go to those tests? All of them. And you get that in seconds. It is really cool. Another thing I uh, did was uh, usually uh, I have seen that uh, many QA engineers uh, struggle with uh, recognizing the source code. And uh, here, what what I got is I put some source code and uh, intentionally I missed the ending uh, script tag at the end. So uh, I got everything explained in details and uh, also the fixed code, which is also really cool. So, uh, just to make sure that not everyone is already asleep, uh, can you tell me uh, the problem with that code? Very quickly. Yes, exactly. Okay, collective answer. This is uh, what ChatGPT also said, and uh, it even gave me two opportunities. Uh, to remove one of the lines or just to swap them, which is really cool. And uh, Next one, I wanted a test strategy, and I got test strategy, something even, even better. Uh, for e-commerce website and for a safety critical airplane software, I got different responses that were uh, absolutely corresponding to the context of the testing, which is also something cool. Uh, one of my boring tasks is actually every week to send reports to the top management. Recently I got promoted, so currently I'm uh, responsible for QAs, but also front-end developers, back-end developers, and uh, our integration team, which is uh, more like back-end DevOps. 
So uh, I collect uh, their reports and I have to prepare the big report to send it to my boss. So uh, I tried something like this. Uh, disclaimer, this is a fictional person. We don't have John in our company, but uh, the email is quite uh, similar to that. So I think you can read for yourselves, but uh, I will read it very quickly. We have found a regression on RC1, so we will need to build an RC2 for the next version, yada, yada, yada. We want to remove that damn download worker. Uh, button and uh, also please mer add Mary to the QA group mailing list and uh, also we have 200 plus failing tests and it shows green and uh, yeah ChatGPT analyzed all of that and put them in tasks done next week task issues and broker and because uh, it didn't know what to do with Mary it even added it to the additional notes so uh, I decided that I'm really frustrated by this, uh, not adding Mary to the QA group. So I decide uh, to write to my imaginary boss, Patrick. He's not Patrick. Anyway, and I put the following prompt. Write a polite one paragraph email to my boss, Patrick, that uh, I got tired of the bloody QA group mailing lists. And this is the job of the lazy HR department who only drink coffee and stretch their legs the entire day. Real one, isn't it? Wouldn't be very good if uh, my boss does that. And look uh, at what ChatGPT made. Dear Patrick, I hope all is well. I wanted to bring your attention. Wow, so what? Yeah. So this is something else we could use ChatGPT for, and it is uh, really good. Now, next one is uh, generating uh, automation page object model of the main page of Plant.io in TypeScript. I did it, it uh, scraped uh, these uh, IDs and uh, it got really good in a very, very little time. So. Okay, let's do it in our automation. It didn't work. And I can explain why. So the reasons are several. First, uh, these models are trained with generic data. And we are using Japan Spock. Uh, and uh, we have also uh, added some tools for uh, video recording and uh, uh, saving those video recordings of the tests. We also have some screenshot staking. We have config files. We have some very specific internal methods. Uh, we also have uh, uh, page, page object model uh, and the repeating uh, stuff is uh, in an abstract page class. So we save some coding and uh, make the, our maintenance, uh, maintenance easier none of this was considered by the model. So it worked like a really, really junior QA engineer who has heard of automation, probably visited some course, really good at that, but had no idea of what we have done up to now. So uh, we are continuing uh, work on that. Maybe next year I can talk here about how, how we made the automation uh, with uh, ChatGPT, but for now, it is good to ask uh, for a, some generic code, but not to uh, rewrite your entire automation. But anyway, I can give you some tools and uh, I'll start with uh, Copilot because I guess uh, all of you have heard of it. If it is about AI uh, and coding, go with Copilot. Uh, and uh, I will give you some more. I see some people, uh, some people grabbing their phones. Uh, I will give you a link for the slides at the end. Anyway, so next one is Gretel. And Gretel is really good for anonymizing your data in real time. So uh, if, you, if you need uh, some test data that is anonymized, Gretel, try it. Uh, it looks really cool. Another thing is the so-called self-healing tests. And I have two tools for that. Uh, one is Functionize, which is uh, 
self-healing, uh, which means uh, if something has uh, been, let's say, uh, an object has been moved to the other uh, component of the page or uh, some of the object properties have changed, let's say, the ID. Uh, these tools, they record everything about the objects and are able with a very high probability to tell, okay, this is the same object, but now it's a little bit different and heal your test uh, automatically, saving you time on uh, test maintenance. This is something that does absolutely the same thing, but uh, for Selenium scripts only, Helenium. And uh, where else we could uh, actually use AI? Test trigger. Test trigger, uh, you just write uh, in Native English, what, what would you like? For instance, purchase a Kindle from their homepage and uh, you get some uh, specific commands based on that. And uh, my newest discovery, uh, the day before we used it uh, on the exploratory testing workshop, really good. So uh, you download uh, Testcraft, which is a Chrome plugin. Uh, this is on the TestCon Europe site. You just uh, click the button, you select uh, an object, not very large object because uh, it cannot deal with a lot of code. But the, the cool part is that it generates automatically different test ideas based on the content of the page in real time. So here you will have uh, positive tests, negative tests and creative test scenarios. So. Uh, yeah, I would like uh, to tell you and uh, wh what uh, I think will happen about the future. No one knows, of course, but uh, yeah, I see my future like this, more or less. I'm uh, drinking my cocktail next to the pool and I have some uh, robots with AI that are doing my activities. And actually, this is exactly what I prompted uh, for to generate uh, uh, this image. And now let's look closely. What is this guy doing? Drinking cocktail. And this guy? He's eating snacks. I really hope that this guy is just bringing my, tea, my toothbrush and not something else. But uh, yeah, the main point here is that uh, we should be really, really careful and uh, observe what the AI is, is doing because otherwise uh, it will be really tricky. And uh, I really like this comic, by the way, uh, from monkeyuser.com. So, circle of AI life. First, humanity is uh, researching AI, then uh, it perfects it, and the next obvious step is that the AI perfects it itself. And of course, uh, what we have, have seen on many movies, AI enslaves humanity. Then we have uh, the solar flare that disables AI, and uh, after all, humanity worships sun god. <laughs> yeah, and this repeats over and over again during the centuries. I don't know if it is true, and uh, yeah, Yesterday, uh, Rick's, uh, Rick had a similar presentation. It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine where I am. So, uh, very quick stats, actually. Uh, approximately half of all of the work activities could be automated using uh, the technology. And, uh, yeah, there will be a displacement uh, for the US only, it will be up to 85 million jobs by 2025, but at the same time, we'll create 97 million new jobs, which is not that bad, is it? And uh, yeah, more than half of the workers feel that AI and automation will actually positively impact their work. So uh, the advanced technologies, they can help uh, the businesses achieve more productivity, than the traditional automation approaches. But uh, let's, let's look at a study that is uh, from IBM and actually uh, repeats what Rick said yesterday on his talk, if you have been there. So uh, AI will not replace the people, but people who use AI will replace people who don't use AI. Uh, 
According to IBM, in the next three years, 40% of workers must learn new skills that aren't connected somehow to AI. Of course, uh, some jobs will change and most bosses think that uh, AI will augment uh, and I want to focus on that word. Jobs will be not lost, they will be augmented. They will be not automated entirely by the AI. And uh, one other very important uh, point, soft skills matter. So uh, when uh, you have a very good uh, coder in the face of the artificial intelligence, uh, then the technical skills uh, become less important. And uh, the important stuff is actually communication, flexibility, time management, and uh, they will be really more important. And uh, yeah, uh, from R.E.M. I will go to another favorite songs. Spice Girls, you remember them? Okay, so we expect that no more source code writers will be needed. Companies will only want real developers. You don't need the expensive secretaries. You need real PMs. You don't need first level tech support. You will need real troubleshooting engineers for the serious problems. And of course, in the QA field, no one wants monthly clickers. The, uh, people want real QA engineers who can understand the system, who can automate their work, know where to look for, for bugs, and so on. And uh, yeah, in short, the game is changing, so you have to learn or burn. Or Another example, just imagine that uh, you are a tractor driver, or you have been uh, until now. Okay, AI now will learn how to drive the tractor, so you will have to evolve from a task executor to a task giver, so probably you will stay with your laptop in command of 10 AI tractors. You will still have the job, and you will be like 10 times more productive. So. Uh, if any of you is afraid of change, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, we will all have to adapt. And the last song for today, the AI have never bored me anyway. Uh, before the final slide, uh, very quick thanks. Uh, as I said, uh, AI was quite a new topic uh, by the time I was applying uh, at Testcom Europe. So uh, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues. I literally took the best from their presentations and combined it into this one. Another invitation, please come to Bulgaria. We are uh, getting there at the end of September next autumn. Thank you. This is the QR code. And uh, as I said, for the questions, I'm ready to uh, answer right now. And the good questions, we'll receive free tickets, so contact me after the uh, topic. Thank you.